Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of the European Employment and Social Rights Forum. I welcome you here on site as well as online. Today we'll start with a plenary panel and we'll have three rounds of breakout workshops to deep dive into a number of themes relating to the impact of AI on the world of work and have discussions in smaller groups. Lunch will be served at around 1 and at about 5.30 will have a closing followed by a reception. If today you are joining us for the first time, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ali El Jabri. I'm a professional moderator and presenter, a former lecturer of public policy at The Hague University and TV correspondent at Associated Press News in Europe. It's a great pleasure to be with you a second day. Some practicalities before we kick off. There's a Wi-Fi password screened behind me. A QR code is on your badge, which will take you to the program as well as social media links. They include a live feed on X, the former Twitter, as well as a feed of photos on Flickr that you can use. Interpretation is provided both here in the plenary room as well as the breakout sessions to and from French, English, and German, in addition to international signed language, a velotypist provides subtitles. The event is hybrid, and participants from all over the world can follow and interact. Online participants are invited to use the networking feature to connect by chat or video call with other participants. If you are on site, you can refer to the reception desk to book a meeting room. Our opening speaker, will speak in French. He is the Commissioner for Internal Market. Please join me welcoming Commissioner Thierry Breton. Well, good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here to, today with you, but I'll just speak in English now so that you, I'll let you the time to um, to put your, your earphone if, uh, if you need it, but I'm sure that everyone understands French, but still. Do you have an uh, AI translator? Uh, another human, so hello. It's much better. I would like to say that I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and to be able to take part in this social forum on a very important subject with my friend and colleague, Nicholas Schmidt. Artificial intelligence and the world of work. It's a vast subject, one that I think was addressed yesterday and will continue to be today through different opinions and different aspects. And at the risk of surprising some of you, I would say that this is not necessarily a new issue. It is new, of course, from the point of view of some applications, perhaps, but not necessarily from the point of view of transformation or transformations that it brings about and will bring about in the world of work. History taught us this. The history of the industrial sector, the history of progress, the history of technological advancements, we're not going to go back as far as the revolt of the Canots in Lyon in 1830 or that of the Luddites in Great Britain. But basically, shocks in the world of work are as old as the history of technological progress. I can perhaps speak of a creative destruction. The term is always appropriate to each wave of innovation. We know the most recent of these waves of innovation, steam, electrification, the first wave of computing in 1943, the first computer at Los Alamos, and then 25 years later, mini computers, then 25 years later, PCs, then 25 years later, the internet. As you can see, these 25-year cycles are quite common in technological developments. And I've often wondered about this myself when I was at the head of companies working in these areas of technology, technologies that were going to have major implications in our economic and social environment. 
These 25-year cycles represent, roughly speaking, a generation. Why 25 years? That's the best answer I can come up with, because it's probably, it probably takes at least one generation to really get to grips with these transformations and to accompany the changes they bring about in the organization of our social life. A social life that itself depends on the organization of industrial revolutions and developments and the social changes they brought about. So we are facing a new wave, a new phase in this evolution, and we need to approach it in this context. In much the same way as we have done over the past decades or even centuries. Of course, to come back to this, artificial intelligence and the data economy are very closely linked, which is why we don't yet make a clear distinction between one and the other. It's a new data it's a modus operandi, it's a new economy of data. And I keep telling you that you loved the first wave of data, which was about personal data, and you're going to love the second wave, the wave of industrial data, the use of which is going to be exponential compared with the data that may have been used or exploited previously, and which has led to new services for us. Obviously, now that we have industrial data, we are entering another world. And this is the world we wanted to prepare ourselves for at the Commission by defining how we can organize this space that I call the information space, the space of data. Since the beginning of my mandate, I've been working on this with a truly holistic approach. I remember I had calculated the amount of data that generated the first evolution, that of the platforms. At that time, we were using your personal data to create services and we invented a new economy known as the two-sided economy, to use the words of Jean Tirole, laureate of the Economics Nobel Prize. And after that, we put a cost, a price on this data and services were born. So I really wanted to take a holistic approach to organizing our world of data. We were the first continent to do so. And let me tell you, it's very difficult. Why is that? Well, because first you need to have a vision. Of course, you need training. You have to constantly rely on the co-legislators because we are a democracy. The European Union is the largest democracy in the free world, one, of, one at a time one and a half times bigger than the United States, and we have 450 million citizens. We have our rules, they are what they are, but they are democratic. We have a European Parliament that represents us, the 450 million citizens of Europe, and then we have a European Senate, if you allow me, if you allow me this analogy, which is the Council, representing the member states. It's a bicameral democracy, and when we propose a law, we have to line the positions of the Parliament and the Council, and that's not easy. It's not easy, but we've done it. And some people can't do it. The United States can't do it because politics is what it is and because it's difficult to get a consensus in both chambers. And I can tell you that it's difficult, but yes, we've managed it. When we can't, then what do we do? Well, we put our trust in those who are now the giants of this world. We establish rules of good behavior. This way we have tried to involve the co-legislators who represent our democracy. And I can tell you that we have had some extremely rich discussions. You know, I've been around the world, I know just about all the players involved, including the European Parliament, and it is this Parliament which is most familiar with these issues. Because for four years now, the European Parliament has been working hard on these regulations. This is what we tried to do for AI as well. Our approach was first to explain what AI is and then to manage the risks. As with any evolution, there are risks, and it's not a question of stopping innovation, but simply of trying to identify the risks. And then we need to support all of our fellow citizens, and particularly the workers. So first of all, we need to explain what AI is. I think we all agree on this, but I want to say this very quickly. AI is going to change the way we work. There will be, obviously, jobs that will, be, that will disappear, some that will evolve, so some that will change, and others that will be invented. So we need to think about this and think about it constantly, knowing that we don't have all the answers, but we need to find ways of supporting our fellow citizens, because skills are going to have to evolve, from schools to universities, but of course, also when it comes to the workplace. 
the working environment is going to be different and relations between employees and employers will be affected. These changes are obviously going to be profound and we, we must not underestimate them. You know, we're talking about AI now, but these changes have been happening for years. I come from that world and I can tell you that we didn't discover AI with ChatGPT. We've been using data intelligently for years now. We've been using data lakes. So it's, we've been using them for years and now everything is speeding up. So we need to anticipate and support these changes. And why is that? Well, because we know that some of them will be problematic. I was in China, in Beijing, three days ago, and the way AI is being managed there is probably not uh, the one we want, particularly with social scoring or the surveillance of citizens, including in the world of, wor in the world of work. And if we are not careful, this could lead to a deterioration in social relations and social ties, which would be totally unacceptable. So we have our rules, we are uh, governed by the rule of law, we have our values, and it's about ensuring that in all these developments, these rules not only don't disappear, but are strengthened. And that's why artificial intelligence is also a tremendous opportunity. Firstly, we can use it to perform dangerous jobs or activities that we no longer want to do. Robots, robots can replace humans to do arduous activities underground, underwater, under fire, on roofs or whatever. The list of examples is almost endless. But to do that, we need to adapt and be in constant relation with our fellow citizens. And that's why, and I'll say it again, the role of the European Parliament in representing its citizens is so important. I don't know of any other democracy, including the United States, where this role and this connection are so strong and direct. We hope it will be, but it's not yet the case. Secondly, how can we learn to manage risks? What does that mean? It can be summed up in one concept, which I mentioned a moment ago. Our European values, which we have developed year after year, decade after decade, industrial revolution after industrial revolution, have formed the foundation on which our democracies, our continental and national democracies, operate. And we have put all of this in a common pot, and that is the rule of law. And this rule of law, in all its aspects, including social relations, must endure. It is a non-negotiable asset. And we need to see how, in relation to this foundation of values, the advances and new possibilities offered by AI, AI strengthened, strengthen but do not weaken this asset. And that is precisely why we have proposed a risk-based regulation. The idea is not to kill off innovation, but to ensure that our values, those that underpin our life together, are preserved, including in the face of, of these developments in artificial intelligence. This is the whole philosophy behind the AI Act, which I've been promoting since the first day of my mandate. We've been working on it for four years. And sometimes people say to me, as my friend Tony Blinken said to me, you're going too fast. And I told him, Tony, we've been working on this for four years. Too fast? We've consulted all the countries, including the United States. It wasn't the same president at the time, but we consulted them nonetheless, as well as all the companies, NGOs and the academic world. We always proceed the same way. First, we organize widespread consultations so that everyone can have their say, and then we shoulder our responsibilities. The commission being the institution out of the three institutions that holds the pen, then drafts its proposal. But it's only a proposal. We are not the legislators. Governance is, is very important, you know. When I was teaching governance at Harvard University, I always explained to my students that they always had to know from where they are talking from. I know where I'm talking from. I'm speaking on behalf of the European Commission, which is not the legislator, but which, as is its duty and role under the treaties, proposes a new regulation to the, to the legislators. It is then up to them to adopt it, modify it, amend it, and then vote on it. This was the case for the AI Act, which, as I said, is risk-based, meaning that it establishes levels of risk. Acceptable, a little more complicated, prohibited, so it's quite simple. And then we can 
plug in as we did for the DSA and DMA, meaning that we can then implement vertical regulations if necessary, because technologies evolve and we have a horizontal framework, which is, by the way, also a tool for dialogue with the companies that are going to innovate. You know, when I was a company director, I always said to my colleagues, we are not here to tell the states in which we operate what to do. We're here to understand what they want so that we can adapt, be good students, good citizens. But to do that, we need to have a vision and simple rules that are understood everywhere. That way, at least, we know what we can and cannot do. The worst, and including when trying to innovate, is to have no goal whatsoever. So we simply want to set ourselves a goal that is consistent with our values and the rule of law. And this is exactly the, the philosophy we have adopted. Parliament has voted on its position. The Council has voted on its position. And as you know, we are now in the final phase, the phase of the trilogues. There have been a number of them already, and there will be uh, more at the beginning of December. And I hope that we will be able, able to come to a conclusion. As we all know, it's complicated. Some people say that Europe is moving too fast, but Europe is not going too fast. Europe is doing its job. We are policy makers and we are here to propose changes to our democratic systems. And if we don't do that, we know that it's the companies that will do it for us. We've seen this in the, digi in the digital world, for example, with the DSA. Now we have a dialogue. It is what it is, but we are the ones saying what our fellow citizens want and how businesses should adapt and not the other way around. And that's the story of our lives. At no time in our history have we ever decided to hand over the keys to our future to a company. It's the same for the digital world. Even if it's a new world, everyone has to shoulder their responsibility. And we are shouldering ours in a very simple, very visible way and certainly not by stifling innovation. On the contrary, rules are a factor, a um, um, driver of innovation. I've seen this all my life in all the companies I've managed. When you have rules, at least you know where you have to put the money. You know where you have to put the research. If you want to do social scoring, for example, there's no point in investing in Europe because it will be banned. If, on the other hand, you are proposing, proposing artificial intelligence algorithms for healthcare, be our guests. There will be strict rules, but that's because health is important. It's important in the context of data sets, for example, to know who has given their data or from whom data has been taken in order to create models, in particular, to be able to anticipate certain types of, patho of pathologies. It's important to know this. To have knowledge of data sets is important, but it is allowed. As you can see, we're constantly trying to give these simple guidelines so that we can just shoulder our responsibilities and not delegate them to others whom I'm not criticizing, but who have other responsibilities. Their stakeholders are not ours. I know who my stakeholders are. You, the parliament, the NGOs, the, the council, they are our, our stakeholders and we must take them into account. That was for my second point. And as I said, I hope we'll be able to conclude it all very soon. We are now uh, well advanced in this third or even fourth, I believe, trilogue. And the next one will take place, as I said, at the beginning of December. My third point, and I'm going to try to speed this up because I'm a bit long, but it's a fascinating, a fascinating subject. We could spend all morning on it. It's a subject on which I've worked so hard, to which I've given so much thought and for several decades, to tell you the truth. So my third point is obviously the need for support as we as with any change, any transition, you have to provide support again and again and again. That's why I'm so happy to be here with you, because it's forums like these where people can express themselves that matter. There will be other people who will express, express themselves, whose opinions will not be in line with mine, I'm sure. But at least we discuss, we talk, we explain what we're doing. And I think we can all agree on one thing, we can't leave anyone behind. How can we support this transition? Well, it all depends on skills. Skills are absolutely key. I've seen it. We have taken on more than 120 new artificial intelligence specialists. Uh, we have taken on data scientists to develop our ability to interact with the regulations we are putting in place to support what we do in the information space. And it's hard to recruit these young people, these talents, because 
the competition is fierce. Quite often, they are offered absolutely incredible working conditions, including across the Atlantic. And the same goes for young people coming from our schools. This morning, I heard about what we're offering these new talents. The figures cannot compare with, with what we have had in mind until now. There is a shortage, so we obviously need to continue to train and interact with the academic world. For example, we are currently short of 200,000 uh, cybersecurity experts in Europe. There are 350,000 job vacancies for data professionals, and these are exciting careers for young men and women who want to work in these fields. So we need to give our universities and our academic world the means to move forward. Nicholas and I are working hard on this. And that's why the Commission, this week, proposed a package of measures on the mobility of talent, because we also need to be able to welcome these young talents when they are not European so that they can join us. Because, and I repeat, we are going to offer, in Europe, the best place to innovate. In other words, we're going to offer a simple vision, we know what we can and cannot do. We're going to offer a good use of data, of data sets, that's finally clear today. And we're also going to offer processing capacity and computing power that are quite exceptional. We know that startups need this computing power. We're talking about exaflops here. In fact, soon, the first two exascale computers will be joined uh, with the EurHPC. So we need gigantic computing power capabilities. And if we don't have that computing power, it's the big players, who I'm not going to name, who are going to provide it. We've heard about one of them recently. We know who supplies their computing power. We know who they depend on. Microsoft. I'm not passing judgment here, but it's well known. ChatGPT's computing power is supplied by Microsoft. So we need computing power, but under what conditions? What contracts? What are the obligations? This will guarantee innovation. And we are definitely missing something. And this may be an important project for the new commission that will take office in the second half of 2024. We obviously need a capital market. It's not there yet. It needs to be. And we need to work on it. Uh, this capital market exists in the United States and it is too fragmented in Europe and that's a problem because it will be a major factor to support the development of start startups. But in any case, in, the, in terms of the technological, academic and regulatory aspects, there's no doubt that we are the best place to come and invest in artificial intelligence today. But that's only if skills continue to be developed and all the initiatives that will be launched in support of European startups, for example, in such as the Europe Startup Nations Alliance, our financing instruments, our digital infrastructures, will aim to create this favorable environment. Of course, nothing is perfect when it comes to evolving. A lot remains to be written and will be written. But for our part, as politicians, as regulators, with the co-legislators and with those they represent, the European people or the European states, we have decided to shoulder our responsibilities and that is why I am confident. Given that in Europe, the rule of law is so important, so deeply rooted in our history, well, yes, I think that once again, we're going to live through this evolution and make the most of it for each and every one of us. Thank you very much. Commissioner Breton, thank you very much. You. After these excellent introductory remarks, we will now have our first panel, which will consider algorithmic management in traditional workplaces, a role for labor market regulation. I'm delighted to give the floor to the moderator of this panel, who is economist at DG Ample with a focus on the future of work. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mario Mariniello. <laughs> 